Hello, and once again, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. I hope you're all safe and well, and thanks for taking the time to uh, to listen to uh, to this next set. In uh, in a few minutes, I'll be sharing four or five stories, which I do hope that you uh, you like. As I've said, I'm David Driver, writer poet and broadcaster and this is coming from England it's coming from sunny Yorkshire to be uh, to be precise and if you look behind either way inspire create and imagine and obviously it's this side or whichever side you want to go it says imagine create inspire and those are the three words which I would love you love for all you lovely people to take with you Imagine, you cannot imagine enough. The ima imagination is so big, you cannot put a size on it. And create, you can create anything you like, whether it's a story written, told verbally, oral stories, and inspire, inspire yourself and inspire others. So, uh, and also you might see some uh, pictures behind me um, and those stories might be coming a little bit later and we'll kick off today's uh, today's storytelling uh, but before I do always remember it's not compulsory but somewhere somewhere below here is the collection hat so if you were kind enough to donate that would be fantastic but you don't have to do it's not compulsory okay this first one is um, this first one's called Rejected, Redundant, Non-Returnable. And it's always been, uh, it's at the forefront of people's minds to save the planet, the ozone layer, recycle, and it's becoming more and more the everyday norm. Um, and this story is, is, is my sort of take on, uh, on things with uh, my own sort of twist of uh, the, uh, the twist of the imagination. Um, I do hope you like it. Rejected, redundant, non-returnable. Seashell Jack enjoyed a warm cup of coffee as he looked out across the bay. Lighting a couple of candles, he sparked up a conversation with his best friend, Diesel Boy. The conversation went one way, with Diesel just sat on the couch listening. But Seashell didn't want to reply. He was letting off a little bit of steam about better times. His eyes looked at the usual, the rusty bikes and the half-buried monuments of rotting irons, tyres, TVs and endless bags of discarded household waste that were equal to a king's ransom if you were a beggar, tramp or outcast. Seashell considered him a mixture of all three. Another slurp of coffee was taken and the six-day mark down in the little notebook he'd found about a week ago. It was the sixth day that the birds hadn't come. There was nothing left on the bones to pick. And there were plenty of bones to pick from. Whale bones, shark, dolphin, you name it. It was all here, lying on the floor of giant mud tiles. When the sea had decided to disappear, the seagulls had followed suit. Where are the seagulls? Jack thought. Just one, just one seagull please. Where are they? The weather was getting warmer and he had a whole wardrobe for that. Shorts in every colour. T-shirts with I love London. I love New York. And just about I love wherever city emblazed on the front. Flip-flops, sandals, sunglasses, sun cream and baseball caps sat in little plastic crates, all waiting to be worn. Seashell, Seashell Jack wasted nothing. Everything had a use. Everything was recycled. Batteries were more common than pebbles. So he had a constant supply for the CD player, along with his very strange collection of CDs that had been 
discarded. Those up there, those people up there, as he fondly referred to them, discarded most things, even humans. That's how he'd ended up down here. He was past his sell by date, and therefore of no use. Who's going to recycle me and you, eh? Who's going to recycle me and you? Seashell looked at his friend and continued. Who, I ask you? Maybe they could melt us both down and re remould us both into something else. Who knows? Who knows, Diesel? Who knows what they'll do? And with that, he blew out the candles and they both fell asleep. But Seashell didn't sleep for long. He never did when he wound himself up like this. He thought about the day society had cast him out because his business had failed. Was that his fault? He hadn't caused the climate change. He hadn't put the price. He hadn't put a price and purpose on everything. They, they were supposed to recycle. And look, look what they throw out. He found more and more tinned food down here than in any supermarket. Look, look, Diesel, Diesel, look, look, please come and have a look. Look, it's a seagull. Seashell Jack couldn't contain himself and the two looked out of the window at the sight that the morning had brought. His heart nearly, men nearly stopped as water, seawater, began to swirl and fill the bay. Five years' work would be put to the test. The knowledge from the no longer needed books. He welded the hull, repaired the engine, painted, polished and prepared. He'd even painted SS Seashell Jack on the side. The name the brat kids shouted at him, shouted down at him over the years and he had fondly adopted it. Water rose rapidly. They were seaworthy. Without hesitation, he fired up the engine, crying when it purred. Seashell wiped away the tears. He heard shouting and screaming, could smell burning, and then saw flames leap and lick the city above. The water had destroyed the generators and the fuel storage tanks. The seagulls flew overhead. Full ahead, Captain Diesel boy. Seashell Jack's voice trembled with joy. His best friend barked, jumped into his lap, licked his face, and the pair sailed off into the sunset. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that first story. I, um, I certainly, uh, I certainly enjoyed writing it, and uh, I possibly didn't realise what sort of message it has with an ever-changing world and a little bit of uh, light-heartedness in there. And of course, I managed to get. Another dog, it's either a dog, a cat, or sometimes a wizard, which I do get into many of my, uh, into many of my stories. Now this next one, talking of wizards, it's another short story, and um, it's called Castalio Prig, a, uh, a name I've conjured up, conjured up for a wizard. And um, again, it brings about questions of uh, magic, responsibility and where you fit in to uh, where you fit into uh, society. Castalio watched from the western spire as the army approached across the marshes. No words escaped, only a wry smile. Purple eyes took all in, rolling a ball of fire within the palm of his hands. He paused for a moment pondered, and the magic was gone. Barbaric hordes, he thought, how easily I could crush them, consume them within the fire. Puig laughed out loud when he thought of summoning the black hell anti-demons of the swamps. What shall we do with these fools, Shalash? What shall we do? 
The powerful magician spoke to the giant forest snake, which was coiled around the ivory staircase, which spiralled up and up to the star gazer's watchtower. These people are spreading like a disease across the land, killing, ravishing, destroying the towns and cities. Shalash hissed, baring her fangs. Mmm, Castalio pondered. My beautiful village, I have protected her for so long. Closing his eyes at these words, he remembered when he first arrived. Crushing dark beasts and rival magicians with his superior command of the arts. They revered him and he'd taken up residence in the white bone tower of the ancients. Where he had remained for over a hundred years. Just a mere thought and Prieg had transformed himself into a frail old man draped in rags. He wanted to know what the villagers were thinking and reacting to the nearing invaders. As he walked the streets, Castalio saw no fear in the people of the village. Instead, he saw brave-hearted warriors. Both young and old readied themselves, all willing to die, to save the village, and all spoke nothing but good of Castalio Prieg. They spoke of how he had defeated many armies with his magic and watched over the people, protecting them. They said they owed, they owed him a debt and should fight for what they had. Something new stirred inside the magician and he had to sit down. A young girl held his hand and asked if he was feeling well. Prieg sensed a young magician amongst the enemy ranks and wanted to crush him. Magic escaped him, causing a fire. It burned on top of a water barrel, causing the villagers to gather in amazement. They noticed a jar containing the black liquid leaking and a plan formed. Over the next week, the marshes blazed with fire and the invaders were reduced to ash. So you can read into that what you think. Now this next one, this third story is the, uh, it's the shortest so far. And again, it is fiction. It may have a little bit of truth, but I think in life we, um, we all have choices to make and we all come from different countries, we all have different cultures, different beliefs, different things possibly um, holding us back, but then different things propelling us to take greater things and inspiring us, giving us that imagination and making the right choice, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. But it, in my mind, it's always better if it's the, the former. We want to better ourselves, we want to move on, inspire and, uh, and help people out and also strengthen ourselves. So this one is called Choices, and um, it's about a young girl that uh, grows up, obviously, into a woman. And um, let's see if she, let's see if she has made the, uh, the right choice. Elizabeth watched, watched and reflected on life. She watched the men working in the fields and others repairing the roofs of houses with missing slates. She watched the many market stalls manned by men, all decorated with a multitude of, colour, of colourful wares to either cook, wear or clean with. She listened to the travellers from distant lands telling tales of men's heroics. Elizabeth watched young mums push prams or sink their offspring to sleep. Male teachers taught her basics at school, but all that would soon end. The academic year was drawing to an end. She turned 16, have to marry and bring up a family. It was what was expected of the females. But since the age of 11, Elizabeth had had dreams. 
Her whole body had flooded with fantastic, fueled excitement, with the thought of horse riding, sailing, adventure, running her own business, and seeing with her own eyes a rare blue orchid, which only grew on top of a snow-capped mountain in a faraway land. These dreams had come from books. Books she had found up, she had found washed up on a beach along with other items from the shipwreck. From an early age she had been told that the port was a bad place, a bad place for girls. Boys and girls shouldn't mix, they had said, unless the parents had arranged it. And on the ship girls and boys mixed, showing no respect for tradition. They brought uncivilised ideas to the shores, but they also brought wealth in the form of silk and spices. It was the smell of spices that brought Elizabeth back to the present. Opening her eyes, she smiled at the sight of her children, running fingers through her long hair. She remembered the day she had cut it short, just like a man's. Her raven black locks had been tossed into the fire along with her claws. The young adventurer had dared to board a ship, disguised as a sailor, destined for distant lands. Silence fell and the lights went out. A cake was carried in, decorated with the words, Happy 80th Birthday! Singing at the top of her voice, Elizabeth's youngest granddaughter gave her a big kiss at the end of the traditional song. Glancing at the photographs on the dresser, Elizabeth reflected on her life. She was young and riding a horse. A picture of her late husband, dressed smartly and as handsome as ever, and wearing her huge smile, stood on the top of a snowy mountain, pointing at a flowering orchid. Standing, she walked over to the window. Looking out, a fleet of ships were leaving port, loaded with silk. They were Elizabeth's ships. They were part of her business empire. Turning to face her family, glasses were raised, along with cheers. The once raven black hair was now the colour of the clothes and locks. She once threw into the fire, and her face was mapped with lines of love and loss. But time had not taken its toll on the eyes. They still burnt a deep, strong, determined blue, full of life and passion. Smiling once more, Elizabeth knew she had made the right choice. Well, I do hope that you have enjoyed the first three stories and uh, I have two more I have two more to uh, share with um, to share with you today on this uh, on this set of uh, of short stories and a little well quite a change in uh, in theme if you like um, spoken about choices I've spoken about a wizard and I've spoken about possibly a post apocalyptic um, recycling future and uh, and that sort of thing but sometimes and delve into the uh, sort of space travel and uh, Android robotics and that sort of thing and delve into the idea of um, life on uh, other planets or life on other planets life coming to earth and um, life or, or human beings creating life artificial life forms quite a uh, quite a good debate um, that's, that, that's my opinion on that one I've got two um, two more stories and they they are taken from a book um, which I wrote called the weird wonderful unique and unusual lives of everyday people where I, um, I put together a collection of short stories um, we should deal with the, well as this title suggests the unusual sort of everyday thing but maybe possibly leaving, leading an alternative life, a double life. And this was called, um, I haven't shared this one for quite a while, this was called um, Flat Cap Freddy. Poor old Freddy. 
Flat Cap Freddy, as the people of the village called him. One of our country's widowed elderly gents. Polite, always willing to help, talkative, beige, close, walking stick, and a number of flat caps, each with a different coloured feather pinned to it, along with the badge of a country. He was always out and about. People felt sorry for him and went out of their way to help him. He lost his wife and didn't seem to have any children or grandchildren who came to visit. He lived in a large five-bedroomed house close to the woods and not too far from the railway station. Some residents found this a little strange. They would walk past his home, point and hold court. Maybe they felt sorry for him. Maybe they wanted to mow the lawn or weed the rose garden. Some may have thought that if they could, they would paint the window frames or replace the broken tiles on the roof. It might have been that these kind folk assumed inside flat caps abode. The bathroom would need a good clean along with the kitchen. The empty bedrooms would be dated, dusty, lacking laughter and that homely feel. But maybe they just wished he'd join his wife and let someone else own the property. It might sell for a low price, which might also include the apple orchard and the six acres of land to the south side. Everyone was Freddy's friend, but no one came back to the house. Mondays weren't a bad day. It was the start of the week. Freddy, he fed the ducks at 9.15am, just when all the mums had dropped off their kids at school. He liked the attention, the smiles, the pet dogs on leads and the young babies snuggled up in prams. They all played a part in his life. The cafe was nice too. It had recently undergone a makeover, moving from mugs of tea and a full English to cappuccinos and sesame seed buns served with carrot and coriander soup. The staff liked Freddy. They talked to him, humoured him, asked him questions about the good old days and always served him an extra large slice of coffee cake. Tuesdays were a half day. Everything seemed to be closed. Flat cap faced the world a little later. Tea and toast were served up by the man himself while he listened to the radio. The butcher closed at one o'clock but always kept a couple of nice pork pies for Freddy. He liked his pie and peas lunch and always had two or three bottles of beer afterwards and fell asleep until early evening. Wednesdays and Thursdays were about the same. Up early, a nice drink of tea, a bacon and egg sandwich, a stroll in the woods and then a trip to church to enjoy the company or a visit to the community centre where it was either art class or camera club. Friday was fish and chip day, another walk in the woods and followed with a trip to the local chip shop. Freddy always accompanied his second favourite dish with three slices of heavily buttered brown bread and a large bog of tea. The afternoon was filled with music as Flat Cat loved listening to the radio. The weekend was quite a different story and Flat Cat Freddy was a very early bird indeed. Up at 3am to the sound of a tea's made. After this lovely warm drink to start the day, he dressed and left the house, taking with him corned beef and tomato sandwiches from the fridge and his thermos flask filled with lovely, delicious coffee. Flat Cap Freddy took the 402 AM train, which trundled up the tracks as far north as he could travel. He reached his destination at 7.13am, 
and enjoyed a full English at a nearby cafe. After that, he went for a long walk in the woods. At 11.07pm, he left the station and headed south, arriving at his destination at 6.18am. Again, Freddie enjoyed a breakfast at a local, local cafe. They know him well and were glad to top up his now empty flask with more coffee. He also, he also purchased more corned beef and tomato sandwiches, which would be enjoyed in the local woods at about 1pm. At 12.02am, Flat Cap caught the northbound train home, which would arrive at the station not far from his home. He always treated himself on this particular journey to a double cheeseburger, fries and a coffee. This was always bought at approximately 11.50pm and allowed Freddy enough time to make the short walk round the corner to the station. He always took a quick slurp of coffee, looked at his watch and then boarded the train. There was never any question about bagging or getting a window seat and he often thought of better times as he munched away and started out into the night. The train always arrived at 4 or 2 a.m. Freddy made the short walk home and he went straight to bed. But he always made sure he was up in time to feed the ducks at 9.15 a.m. and speak to the mums. Poor old flat cap Freddy. Another week would begin and he'd soon be doing the same things meeting the same people and spending his nights alone in his big house. The train journeys were nice. They gave him a chance to think of better times. Everyone was so nice to him wherever he went and he enjoyed his meals. But it wasn't the same. He had no loved ones left. No one to call family. No one to speak with in the evenings and cuddle up to at night. He was alone and vulnerable. His life was empty and he felt that he just could not go on. As Freddy lay in bed, he flicked through some of the old photograph albums. He smiled at the memories. He remembered the party they had held back, way back in 1977 for the Queen's Silver Jubilee. That was the last year he and his wife were together. Flat Cap remember, remembered all too well the outbreak of war in 1939. But he also remembered when it broke out in 1914. Freddy closed his eyes and he remembered the sinking of the Titanic, the Zulu uprising and the planting of the apple orchard back in 1883. He's in all the photographs. Is it worth it anymore? He said out loud to himself. All the effort he'd gone to in the woods. All the travelling north and south by train and still no contact. No contact with his kind, his people. Flat Cap Freddy was possibly the last of his kind. Freddy's kind had to adapt in order to survive. They'd had, they'd had to become part android due to famine, plague and a war on their home planet. His kind arrived on Earth over 200 years ago from a dying planet billions and billions of miles away. They came in search of hope and a new beginning. Four ships arrived at first, each carrying eight people, but over time... All contact between them had been lost. They'd had to adapt once more to blend in with the humans. They'd adopted more human qualities in favour of their android ones. Communications were sent at regular intervals to their home planet so that his people could follow. They'd found a new home in which they could live and be happy once more. No one else came, but they still lived in hope. Tables, chairs, computers, 
Walls full of screens all gathered dust. The signals had all reached the home planet. Some of the screens still had a little power in the cells operating them and displayed the information. Back on the home planet, ships waited. Waited to be launched, but no one could pilot them. The plague had dominated. They were all dead. Freddy had to make sure, though. The trees in the woods by the house were home to communication devices. Send these signals out to all planets or others who may wish to visit Earth. It was the same in the woods to the north and in the south. Flat Cap put them down there. Flat Cap Freddy. He laughed at this name. He'd become to. He'd, he laughed at this name. He'd become known as. He laughed again at the thought of what people would say and do if they knew what was under it. Red, green and blue lights flashed as he removed his cap. Hundreds of tiny silicone chips processed information. Freddy plugged in several leads which connected to two small screens. He read information at a phenomenal rate, speaking hundreds of languages unknown to mankind, making sure all communication had been received and answered. A new home, he'd thought. He thought again thought about the famine, plague and war they'd left behind and the famine, plague and war they'd found on Earth. Freddy held a picture of the ship they travelled in and smiled at the initials on the side. F.C.F. They, they were the same as his adopted name, Flat Cap Freddy. But back then they stood for First Contact Fleet and he was known as R.V. 282 male. The last of the information was processed. His job was done. He double checked, nodded his head and smiled. Freddy had lived on two planets and had had to adapt to different life cycles. He thought about the killing machine he had encountered known as the human race and had made sure no one else encountered it. First contact fleet had completed their mission. Slowly reaching up, his hand found the off button on the top of his head and he pressed it. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that one. A take on uh, a, a take on um, life itself. And I will finish, I will finish on one. And this is actually set on Earth. And it, well, it might involve humans, it might not. And I quite like this one. It is the shortest of the collection um, that I put together. And I've had, uh, I mean, people do like this. Uh, I've shared this one before. It's called um, Moonlight, Moonlight Couple. And uh, inspired, obviously, by couples. Couples living together, loving together. And full moon, that sort of thing. But Moonlight Couple. Um, let's see if you like it. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was no breeze. Stree trees stood tall and proud, and a full moon held, helped display a palette of magnificent autumnal colours. Nocturnal denizens came out to play and did not hide or flee when a young female danced and whistled along a path which brought her to a clearing in the woods. A young man walked briskly towards the clearing from the opposite direction. He was singing the words to the tune. The woman was whistling. Both ran when they saw each other and embraced with laughter and kisses. After a few shared jokes and more laughter, both enjoyed a short swim in the lake before dressing. A joke was shared and they proceeded to walk towards the seafront of the town. Stopping by a row of cottages, the man jumped over the garden wall of the end property. He quickly returned with a wallet of money and someone watching from an upstairs window did nothing more than draw the curtains. 
Many couples and families walked along the seafront and the couple from the woods blended in with ease. Smiling, they shared a few more laughs whilst reading the joke postcards. Changing a note into coins, the pair indulged in the seaside arcade games. After about an hour, both checked the time and left the arcade. It was a clear night and they took time to sit and enjoy a little stargazing, holding hands and sharing private jokes. The man got to his feet and performed the dance which made his partner laugh out loud. She jumped up and joined in. The two people in love walked hand in hand to a pub they knew well. Inside it was full. The atmosphere was warm and friendly and the landlord knew them both by name. He served them the usual and they found a corner by the open fire. The landlord presented them with a food hamper when they won the raffle and after three more drinks they left. Behind the counter of the fish and chip shop the proprietor smiled. She indulged in a little conversation with the young couple. She had recognised the moment she saw them. Plenty of salt and vinegar was applied. An extra half fish was given free of charge and the supper was well wrapped. The only thing better than the smell was the taste. Enjoying the seaside supper, they both looked out and enjoyed the sea and the gentle waves. When they had finished them, the man showed, he showed off by trying his luck with the newspaper wrappings. He tried a little basketball, tried to throw them into the basket, and he did manage to bag twice, straight into the little bin. It was only a short walk to the burger van, stationed at the, at the top of the steps, which led down to the beach, and the young woman danced all the way there and hummed all the way back. She bought two cups of tea from the overweight man who always served there and loved to flirt with her. She always gave him four pound coins and told him to keep the change. He always smiled and magically made the money pass from one hand to the other. When he performed the trick, he practised for years. After the hot drinks were finished, both took turns to look at the moon through the pretend binoculars they had made from the plastic cups. They found it hilarious, almost fell over with laughter. They looked at their watches, kissed and they started to make their way back to where they had come from. Other people were scarce due to the late hour. The burger man magician had locked up and gone home. The lights were off at the chip shop, but the smell still lingered and last orders had been called at the pub. The only light on, apart from the street lights, was that on the landing of the end cottage they had passed earlier. As they stopped briefly, the curtains moved, and when they had walked about a hundred yards further, the light went out. As they reached the clearing where they had made where they had first met, they kissed and spoke softly to each other. Both checked their watches and glanced at the moon. After a final kiss, they both vanished into thin air. When the sun rose the following day, the back door of the end cottage opened and the owner walked out into the yard. The early riser found a food hamper left on the stone flags with an empty wallet. Taking them inside, the resident of the cottage made an ice drink of tea and a bacon sandwich. The hamper was emptied, the wallet placed in a drawer, and a diary was checked to see on what date the next full moon would fall. The date was circled on a wall calendar with a green marker pen. 
as other residents on the row of cottages turned on their lights and came down for breakfast. The owner of the end property locked their front door, got into their car and drove off to work thinking about the moonlight couple and what they would leave in, in the backyard next time. And that's it. That is it for me for this uh, this my little session that I've shared with you with the beautiful and fantastic storytelling cafe. I do hope that you've enjoyed it. And please stay on the side and check out all the other storytellers and poets and all the other artists. Fantastic bunch of people from all around the world. And I do hope that it, you, it has brought about a little bit of your imagination, your creativity and your inspiration. But for now, take care and uh, I'll see you soon.